makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London with the conversations that matter, and here's what's coming up on today's program. A win for Wall Street banks after the Fed chair, Jay Powell, says regulators are likely to make broad and material changes to controversial bank capital proposals. He again signals there's no rush to cut rates. The ECB is set to hold for a fourth meeting, but the timing of rate cuts will be in focus. We'll look ahead to today's decision. Plus, speculation grows that the Bank of Japan will move in March, raising rates for the first time since 2007 after wage growth comes in hot, sending the yen higher. Now, let's take a look at the European markets map. Again, quite a lot going on. We have a second day of testimony from Jay Powell. A couple of things and a couple, certainly, of companies that we need to keep an eye on. Uh, Novo Nordisk, the one that's leading its benchmark higher. Now, we're seeing stocks slide a little bit. Again, traders awaiting this further testimony from the Fed Chair Jay Powell. We're also expecting this rate decision for the European Central Bank. Yen, as we're saying, rallying gold, extending its winning run to a record high. Um, the focus, of course, as it shifts to the ECB, which is set to keep borrowing costs steady for a fourth meeting, new economic projections, though, could bolster arguments for cuts to start later this year. We also had a big day yesterday for the UK, certainly for the Tories, with the UK budget. Now, we're joined by Catherine Nice, chief European economist and deputy head uh, for global economics at PGM Fixed Income. Also with us, Bloomberg's Justina Lee. So thank you both for joining us. Catherine, let's start off with you. I mean, we had the UK budget. We're now expecting the ECB. It feels like Jay Powell, though, is dominating everything. And you know, the stock markets seem to like it. Yes, so the U.S. Uh, drives financial conditions. Um, there's always a lot of interest, I think, when uh, the Fed chair speaks to Congress. Uh, but typically, we don't really hear new things coming from the chair. They tend to usually use this as an opportunity to reinforce the existing message, which I think continues to be the U.S. Uh, policymakers there are pretty cautious, conservative when it comes to cuts. The economy is doing well. Yes, inflation is coming off. But near-term momentum is still running hotter than I think what would be consistent with 2%. Uh, but on this occasion, the focus was on uh, the regulatory uh, comments that, that he was making. I mean, here, I think uh, the tide tends to go in and out on yep. these sorts of reforms. Uh, but big picture, these regulations, I think, stood us in good stead through the pandemic and SVB. Uh -huh. But this is all about tweaking the edges, I think. Yeah, and Justina, you know, where are you seeing or what are you seeing actually, again, supporting the markets? I know yesterday we also had a good conversation on gold and Bitcoin, you know, sending mixed signals, certainly when it comes to some of the risk appetite out there. What's today looking like? Yeah, and I think it's kind of interesting because like, I think in a way you could say Powell's testimony didn't really have any surprises. But I think that in and of itself was kind of notable, given that there's kind of been concerns that maybe there were going to be no rate cuts this year after the momentum that we're seeing in the U.S. economy. And I think one thing that's been really interesting is like what we've seen kind of from Bitcoin breaking records again is that there's kind of been this really risk on mood mm -hmm. throughout markets. I mean, we were talking earlier about how like even beyond meat is out. I mean, there's just it feels a bit like 2021, which is a bit weird. And of course, in a way, from the Fed's perspective, you could say that's a sign of financial mm -hmm. conditions easing. And so I think mm -hmm. there's a question here of whether the Fed is also going to look at what's happening in markets mm -hmm. and think that they're going to have to rein that in. Um, Catherine, overall, what does this all mean for f fixed income? Because I know, you know a, a lot of fixed income places around the world take their cue f from the Fed. And then I want to ask you about the U.K. budget. So I think the high-level story is we've seen a lot of volatility in rates, and that doesn't really feel like it's, it's going away. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question, you know, initially that volatility, I think, I was, was driven by uh, how high could rates go and then the timing around the cuts. And now it's really uh, focused on what's the landing zone for, for rates over the longer horizon. Maybe uh, that's higher than what we previously thought, given the resilience that we're seeing in the U.S. economy in light of, you know, on the back of these, you know, significantly higher interest rates. So I think volatility is something that's here to stay. Uh, that does generally, and, and of course, together with the higher rates, it creates generally a quite a positive uh, picture for fixed income. Uh, but it still speaks to the need of doing that bottom up assessment in terms of really where are these pockets of value. But that general environment, I think, is a very positive one 
for fixed income. So in terms of pocket of values, is the UK, would the UK be one of them? I mean, I, I guess there was a sigh of relief because there was a worry going into the budget that because the Tories were doing so badly in the polls, the Chancellor would feel the need to do something extraordinary to get voters on side. And that could have been a, a, you know, a credit event, a fixed income event, um, maybe you know, similar to what we saw the, the guilt move under Liz Truss. We didn't get that. Was it a you know, stable but boring budget? I think that's a fair, fair description. <laughs> there were some rumors yesterday that in addition to the well-trailed national insurance cuts that we could also see potentially some income tax cuts. Yeah. And the first thought that crossed my mind was, you know, how, how, how is that going to be funded? And uh, that could create, you know, that had the potential to create some volatility. But in the end, I think we ended up in a place that was, you know, yeah. reasonably limited, reasonably well expected. And so broadly speaking, it yeah. was a non-event uh, okay. in terms of the market reaction, which uh, I think is, you know, perhaps a positive okay. <laughs> given, say, given past experience. I was going to say it's probably a good thing. Okay. I want to also talk about European bonds. The ECB's latest policy decision, of course, we know comes out today. Rates widely expected to be held at 4%. Investors will be looking for hints for when the first cuts might come. Well, Bloomberg's Alessandra Miaccio is at the ECB headquarters in Frankfurt. So, Alessandra, a lot to watch out for. So as um, you were saying at the very beginning, it looks like the ECB obviously is not going to cut this time, um, but we need to figure out when. So we're going to be looking uh, very carefully at what Christine Lagarde says to see if there are any hints as to when they will cut. The market right now is expecting a cut, uh, first cut in June, um, but obviously it depends very much on the data. ECB always says data, data, data is everything. So if they see signs that inflation is truly slowing, if they see signs that wages, which are still relatively high, um, are slowing as well, well, then, you know, we may get the cuts sooner rather than later. Uh, if not, the ECB tends to err on the side of caution, so we may have to wait longer for those cuts, which a lot of governments are asking for because it, it is a matter of the economies, the economies that aren't growing, and they're really, especially southern European countries, waiting for those cuts. Yeah, Alessandra, thank you so much. Of course, those wage negotiations extremely important. Catherine, when you look at the ECB and kind of where Christine Lagarde is on this now, are they the first ones to cut? It could be. Um, and here I think the differences that we're talking about are literally a couple of weeks, potentially a few months. I don't think it's such yeah, a big deal for a very large uh, central so bank like the one. ECB. Maybe that timing and sequencing matters a bit more for really small open economies like the Japanese economy or, or the UK. But uh, just coming back to this point about where next for rates, I think clearly everyone is expecting rates to go down in the ECB. It's all about the timing. But, uh, you know, if you look underneath the hood, there's really a two-speed Europe going on here. The periphery, uh, sure, they would benefit from lower interest rates in part because of that legacy debt, especially for an economy like Italy. But in terms of the economies, those economies are doing pretty well. Uh, Spain, Spain uh, is, is, is growing fast. They grew almost uh, on par with the U.S. economy last year. Even Italy's GDP got revised up. It's significantly higher growth than what we're seeing here in the U.K. And Greece, of course, yeah. uh, continues to be the star of the show. So it's not obvious that they are really desperate for yeah. uh, a cut. And likewise, in the north... Um, we are seeing that uh, we're seeing strikes in Germany. This is parts of the euro area that are really contracting, no. and yet the labor market is still pushing for wage growth rates that are not consistent with 2%. No. So again, it's not obvious that the prescription is right for these economies either. So mm -hmm. I would be minded to think that the ECB is going to be you know, very conservative, very cautious when it comes to cutting rates. And, and just, you know, what does this all mean for valuations of stocks? I mean, they, they, again, if you look at them compared to a lot of the U.S. stocks, they're so much slower. I don't know if there's a momentum for them to grow. Yeah, I think that really is kind of the big question here. But of course, strategists have been saying for a long time that European stocks are, you know, a lot more attractively valued. I mean, that's a bit less true once you kind of adjust for sec sector differences. And I think, you know, Europe has always been a more cyclical destination. Mm -hmm. And so I think investors really are, you know, before they come into this region, they really are looking for kind of signs that growth is stabilizing. Mm -hmm. But of course, there's sort of like a, a particular segment of European stocks right now. I mean, I'm talking about like Novo Nordisk or, you know, the luxury stocks. They're kind of are in a different kind of story. And kind of in that sense, I mean, that's more about 
you know, whether they are offering kind of growth and earnings that are completely sort of immune to the cyclical swings. All right, Justine and Catherine, thank you so much. Catherine Nice, they're from PGM Fixed Income and Bloomberg's Justina Lee. Both stay with us with more market insights. Coming up, we also head to Bloomberg's Power Players event in Jeddah, where we're joined by a guest who's preparing to invest $2 billion in the Gulf. So we'll try and really ask where. And then, of course, after that, we also hear from Christine Lagarde of the ECB. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. So some of the leading voices in sports, entertainment and technology are in Jeddah for Bloomberg's Power Players event. Now, among them, private, private equity firm ZCG. Now, the company has about $7 billion under management and is gearing up to invest $2 billion in the Gulf region. It's also just renewed its partnership with the Scuderia Ferrari team for the 2024 Formula One season. Well, joining us now for an exclusive look at what's in store for the year ahead is the ZZG James Zenny Jr., the founder and chief executive. Thank you so much um, for joining us. I mean, there's a lot going on. There. First of all, your background over there in Saudi Arabia is frankly to die for. Uh, give us a sense of, of where you're pretty, deploying nice. the $2 billion that you, it's pretty nice that you're, you've just raised. Yeah. Where do you see the biggest opportunities in the region? Francie, thanks for having us on. And uh, to be consistent with the region, I'll say Sabah al here. Um, the, the, we've been uh, pretty active uh, in the region for actually a very long time. We, are, we have investors in the region. Um, I've been traveling to the region for about 20 years, to be honest. Um, the initiatives that we've uh, have been discussing have been really an extension of our discussions with the Ministry of Investment here in Saudi. Um, and we've also established a joint venture with the Al Hukair Group, which is a pretty well known family and family uh, company in Saudi. I think they're based in 1975. Uh, very well known in retail, real estate, uh, and they have JVs, to be honest, all over the world. Um, so it's an extension of our discussions with, with the folks at, at uh, the Ministry of, of Investment that that uh, JV uh, uh, came about. Yeah, I mean, there's so much opportunity in infrastructure, it feels like, renewables, in tourism. Where do you see the, the biggest value creation? You know, we've, the JV that, that I just described is to establish uh, a direct lending fund in, in, uh, in the kingdom. Um, and we're also uh, planning on investing through our portfolio companies into the kingdom as well because we, we own great companies uh, that would extend and transcend uh, their brands, their operations here in the kingdom as well. Um, but getting back to the, the direct lending fund, um, if, you, if you really look at uh, the, the, the need for uh, capital and solutions for small and medium-sized businesses in the kingdom, it just doesn't exist. Primarily because the, the bankruptcy and the restructuring laws were really just codified last June. Uh, before that, it was not mm -hmm. even a contemplation for third parties to come into the region. So, we, the, so joint venture between ourselves and the Yahoo Care Group uh, is a great combination. Uh, you know, having them as a partner in the kingdom, having their network uh, as a backer is, is, is great for us. We are establishing a, an office in Riyadh. Um, we plan on yep. uh, adding up to 20, 25 uh, employees and, uh, in the next uh, six months, six or nine months. Uh, James, where do you see the, the biggest opportunities? So I was actually in, in Riyadh in Kingdom about five, six months ago, and this is an ever-changing society, a very young population. I know also sure. um, there's a lot of focus on eSports, sure. on gaming. Where, where do you see the, again, how do you put the money to work in the Kingdom? Aside from the joint venture on the direct lending side, it's, I think it's pretty much across the board in, in industries that need solutions and need growth, and that's good for the kingdom, obviously. And many of these companies just don't have any financing at all. So providing them growth capital is key, in, in our view. Uh, as far as on the private equity side, uh, you know, if you look at the 2030 initiative in, in, in the 15 industries that they're focused on uh, and, and growing in the kingdom, we line up uh, you know, very much uh, consistent with that 
plan, and I think we overlap 11 or 12 of those initiatives. It could be consumer products, it could be hospitality, mm -hmm. it could be uh, uh, restaurants, consumer brands, um, uh, manufacturing. It could be, it could be across the board, frankly, and, and it's very consistent with the 2030 vision. You've just also re-upped uh, your sponsorship with uh, Scuderia Ferrari. I know we're on the eve of another big Grand Prix. H is there, I mean, is F1, I th you think, th the future um, for the region in terms of sports, or will it be, you know, football and, and some of the other ones? You know, I'm not going to comment on, on, the, on, on the football side of things, um, but I, I can speak to F1 to some extent, right? We did... We did re-up our, our, our uh, sponsorship with the Ferrari team. It's a long story how we got there, but we're, we're very much aligned. It's a great organization. Uh, Benedetto Vigna, as you know, uh, has done a terrific job. Um, but the, as far as alignment here in the, in, in the region, uh, they uh, they've very much have backed F1. Uh, they very much want to uh, be consistent in supporting a venue. Uh, for F1. It's here in Jeddah now, but it's moving to Kadia. We actually met, just met with the Kadia folks on our, some of our brands just uh, two days ago. Um, so they're, they're, uh, the, the kingdom is developing Kadia, and in the middle of Kadia is a brand new F1 track, which is it's going to be spectacular. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, James Zenny Jr., their founder and chief executive of ZCG. Now, we'll have plenty more to come. We also talk about the Bank of Japan and China next. This is Bloomberg. So China's exports jumped at the start of the year, offering an early positive signal for recovering global demand as the world's second largest economy contends with trade curbs and geopolitical tensions. Now still with us, Catherine Nice from PGM Fixed Income. Also still with us, Bloomberg's Justina Lee. Catherine, when you look at some of the things that came out of China, I mean, there's a lot because we had the National People's Congress, so there was the exports, you know, this growth target of 5%. What does, I guess, the, you know, deflationary pressures in China mean for the rest of the world? So uh, these, these export numbers and, and the deflationary picture, I think there's sort of two slightly different things going on here. There's the cyclical and there's the structural in, in China. On the cyclical side, I think these stronger exports are telling us or just confirming that wider picture of greater resilience in the U.S. economy and other economies. But clearly there are big structural mm -hmm. factors happening in China, not least uh, the slow bursting of an asset price bubble, which we know comes alongside with uh, falling prices. And for sustainable growth in China, they followed kind of export-led growth model. They've done an investment-led growth model. And what they really now need is a consumption-led growth model. Mm -hmm. And consumption demand is relatively weak, and that is feeding more into this deflationary pressure in China. And um, so you, there is this uh, prospect that we could see this uh, deflationary uh, pressures in China bleed out and spill mm. over to the rest of the economy. You're seeing mm. it in goods prices. But frankly speaking, I think the Fed and the ECB, they're really looking at services price inflation when yeah. it comes to what's happening to uh, uh, their rates decision. Yeah. And so this is sort of secondary, I think, to that bigger picture for rates. Catherine, I, we actually have um, some breaking news out of China, which I think will impact our world, that China is scrutinizing bond buying at some of the smaller banks as the market is soaring. And again, this, this kind of goes to just, you know, the idea that over the past 18 months, it's been really difficult um, to predict some of the moves that policymakers have been put in place. Yeah, I mean, are exports and some of the good news, you know, enough to, to sustain, you know, some of the, the, the weaker parts of the economy? I mean, probably not. And I mean, we have seen the Chinese stock market stabilize a little bit. But I think for a lot of international investors, I mean, they were disappointed with what's coming out of the political meetings right now in China. Because I guess the few headlines we've gotten is, you know, maybe we're going to get another reserve requirement ratio cut. And, you know, the securities regulator vowed to clamp down on market manipulation. But I think for a lot of people, these don't really address the structural weaknesses in the Chinese economy right now. And, you know, we're, we didn't really get a lot of detail 
as to how they're going to reach the 5% GDP growth target. I mean, are they going to have more fiscal stimulus? How are they going to support consumption? And I think these are all still like wide open questions. Catherine, what's your take on the BOJ? I mean, this is one of the most exciting markets right now. <laughs> it is. It is exciting. But I've almost moved beyond uh, coming out of negative interest rate territory. I think that's pretty much baked in either this month or next month. And people are already looking beyond that and asking the question, you know, could rates lift off above zero? Of course, the more resilient the U.S. economy is, I think the more pressure that puts on the Bank of Japan. And the other thing, which I think is just fascinating, is what is is the Bank of Japan going to do on their balance sheet? So what we've seen from other central banks, we do now have a little bit of a, an overview and experience of balance sheet contraction. And there, I think what we've seen is it's happened earlier, it's happened faster, uh, and the impact hasn't been zero, but it's been marginal in terms of contributing to tighter financial conditions. And so the question, I think, for, for us is, is the Bank of Japan going to follow that roadmap are they going to also start early and are they going to start aggressively? And of course, their balance sheet is way, way bigger. Catherine, thank you so much. Catherine Nice and Justina Lee. We'll have plenty more, of course, on the markets. This is Bloomberg. Now, a win for Wall Street banks after the Fed chair, Jay Powell, says regulators are likely to make broad and material changes to controversial bank capital proposals. He again signals there's no rush to cut rates. The ECB is set to hold for a fourth meeting, but the timing of a rate cut will be in focus. Plus, speculation grows that the Bank of Japan will move in March, raising rates for the first time since 2007 after wage growth comes in hot, sending the yen higher. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. So shares in Continental lower today after it warned that flat output and higher staffing costs could hit earnings. The manufacturer says returns are set to improve as it cuts staff and closes plants as it's struggling car parts unit. Well, let's speak now to the chairman, the chief executive, Nicholas Setzer. Mr. Setzer, thank you so much for joining us. Going forward, what is your biggest concern? I know there's been a lot of questions about the supply chain, but also demand to, for some of their components. So first of all, when it comes to supply chain, we have lots of experience during the last three years where we managed lots of several shortages which were coming after the pandemic. So we have a robust team working on that and we will work farther hard in order to improve on where it stands. What's our concern right now? I mean, we have shown it in our market assumptions and that's what we see in particular on the vehicle production. Markets are turning sideways. Automotive production is foreseen to be flattish on the global scale for this year. Looking on industry markets where our the tech sector is mainly dependent on there is a muted market so far and we have seen tire replacement markets they have been as well in negative territory in the last year in particular in the second half so the market is mm. flat will not provide tailwind which means even more that we have to work on our self-help program we have to get more efficient and effective and we have to get our costs down in order to further improve our margins in 2024. Yeah. So, uh, so when are you expecting things to get a little bit better when you look at the outlook? Are you expecting this to be a six, 12 month job or is it just the, the way forward? So how the markets will develop, we don't know. So but what we can see is from the predictions that in particular the automotive market is supposed to only grow slowly over the next five years. That's why we have announced on the capital markets day that we have measures on, in automotive on the administration side where we are getting more lean and more fast, where we work there and create savings and getting our costs down. On the R&D side, getting more effective from the about 12% mm -hmm. R&D to sales rate where we are on a single digit and we have on the operational excellence many measures in all sectors in order to improve on our own given that markets are like they are. Um, give me a sense of, I know there, there's been a little bit of disappointment, actually, that there's been fewer demand or fewer sales of EV cars. Does it mean that you're redirecting your spending into older technologies? We spun off our powertrain business in 2021 in September. And in the meantime, our portfolio is independent from the engine used in the car. So. We will further work on our new technologies, be it autonomous driving, where 
sensors don't care so much about the engine. They are in, on each platform um, and used displays the same. And as well, the tires where we have strong homologations on both areas, on the EV part with the homologations with the 10 largest EV manufacturers as well as on the IC. So we are independent and we are serving the market whatever the market development will be in terms of combustion or IC or electrification. I know you've also um, started a review on some of your sites in Germany and elsewhere. H how much cost cutting or how many plant closures are you potentially looking at? So on the plant and manufacturing side, we already started a transformation program in 2019, which develops then over 10 years. So this is basically done and has been done, though it's a longer program. What we have announced now on our Capital Markets Day in December is that we further work on our structure, such as in administration jobs or on the R&D side. And there, in 2025, on the administration side on automotive, we are planning to save 400 million euro on that side. And on the R&D side, as I mentioned before, we want to get from the 12 percent R&D to sales, where we are right now, down to the nine. Therefore, we will reduce as well positions on the R&D side, while at the mm -hmm. same time, with the new technologies which we are bringing on the market, which are desperately needed, we grow our business. I, I think your chairman in December was also saying that, you know, you were pretty much open to anything to try and fix the auto unit. How, how radical would that be? Would it also be actually selling parts of it off? So we have announced on the Capital Markets Day in December that we review the full portfolio. We did a full portfolio review on automotive and we have two areas where we changed. The one part has been the business area user experience, everything around displays and head-up displays. And there was another bucket of smaller business pieces, overall 25 percent of the automotive sector, which is under review and which is further prepared for all strategic options. So we make those areas independent to be able to pursue those. However, markets are dynamic and we constantly continue to review our portfolio and see what time will bring. That's the responsibility of the board and that's what we will further do. Nikolai Setzer, thank you so much for joining us. That was, of course, the chairman and chief executive of Continental. Now, Lufthansa shares lower today after Germany's biggest carrier warned that earnings will not grow this year because of ongoing industrial action. Now, the airline has canceled almost all flights today as ground staff stage a two-day strike. Well, Bloomberg's Oliver Crook is at Frankfurt Airport and joins us now. So, Ali, Lufthansa actually reported near record profits for 2023. Employees aren't feeling that, are they? No, exactly, Francine. And that's really the story of the day. This was supposed to be about earnings. It's supposed to be about shareholders and kind of what they see for the outlook for the aviation industry. But really, it's been completely eclipsed by this strike in Frankfurt, the biggest hub airport for Lufthansa, which is the biggest carrier in Europe. I mean, just a few hundred feet away, we're now in the sort of uh, Lufthansa Aviation Center where the CEO is giving, speaking to um, the press and to shareholders right now. But we were at the departure gate this morning and watching all of the flights just go blank on the board. There are, you know, more than 200,000 people. He also said in the press conference, maybe up to half a million people that have been disrupted by this strike um, over the next two days. What they want, the Verdi Union, which are the ground staff, they want 12.5 percent increases. They want inflation bonuses. And this is really going to be one of the driving factors for Lufthansa this year in terms of costs, because obviously those wage negotiations are going to be absolutely critical. And it's very hard for Lufthansa, which has reported near profit, um, near record profit, a dividend reinstated. The question is, why are the employees not feeling it? I spoke to the union chief negotiator who was standing there um, and speaking to press, saying that basically the employees are exactly that, not feeling it. And this, of course, has now bled in, Francine, to the ECB story. They went to a virtual meeting because people can't get here. Yes, and, and what about the outlook? I mean, what's it looking like for the next 12 months? Yeah, so listen, they gave a fairly muted outlook, um, all things considered. You know, this was a, supposed to be a year. So broadly speaking, this is about coming back from the pandemic. They still have not hit 100 percent of flight capacity um, since the pre-pandemic levels. Last year, on average, it was 84 percent. They're still trying to fill those seats. They're hoping to get to 94 percent um, capacity this year. But again, they brought back the dividend the first time since 2019. So shareholders are going to be fairly pleased about that. There are a couple dark spots in the business. It's about cargo and the business traveler. They are nowhere near um, kind of what the high level 
levels were previously. But what's interesting, and just speaking to the CEO there, he's saying that the premium, the premiumization trade is still intact. They're saying, in fact, all of their, most of their investments are going to be into the premium side of the cabinet. They, he called it their raison d'etre. So the luxury traveler is still very much intact, Francine. Ollie, thanks so much. Oliver Crook there, of course, outside, well, at Lufthansa. Coming up, we discuss inclusion and diversity in the boardroom with the angel investor and former chief executive of Eka Insurance, Caroline Farberger. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. <laughs> back so it's being called the end of a watershed moment for diversity in the u.s workplace wall street firms including goldman sachs and bank of america are now making some programs meant for people of color and women open to everyone it comes against the backdrop of conservative criticism and pockets of resentment amongst white employees and many executives are now moving to head off accusations of reverse discrimination now beyond wall street zoom has cut its internal team for diversity equity equality and inclusion amid broader layoffs, Tesla has also removed language about minority workers from a regulatory filing. Here in the UK, the benchmark FTSE 100 reportedly set to lose one of its few female chief executives. Sky News reports that Katie Bickerstaff is planning to step down as a co-chief executive of retailer Marks & Spencer. In 2022, she became the first female co-chief executive in the company's history. Now, FTSE 350 companies have improved, though, gender diversity with 47% now meeting requirements set by the Financial Conduct Authority. That's up from just over 30% at the beginning of 2023. Female directors are still rare in the most senior board roles with female chief executives at just 8% of companies. Well, Bloomberg Intelligence also says a lack of progress suggests that companies are more focused on complying with quota requirements, adding female directors to roles with less seniority than promotion into leadership positions. While my next guest says she has a singular take on gender equality issues in the corporate world. Well, Caroline Farberge is the first senior business leader in the Nordics to speak openly about her gender transition. Caroline was previously the chief executive of the insurance arm of Ica, a major supermarket chain in Sweden, and is now a non-executive board director of several firms, including a leading Scandinavian insurance broker, Max Matheson. She once said that she lived undercover as a man for 50 years and says her transition has made her more inclusive. So, Caroline, welcome to The Pulse, and thank you so much for joining us. When you look at the statistics, mm -hmm. there has been progress on diversity, and then there's a wave of backlash, and you feel like we're going backwards. Right. How do, do you read the efforts that have been done on inclusion and diversity in Europe? I think that we have failed to communicate the business value of having diversity on all leadership levels. Unfortunately, the matter of diversity has in many cases ended up in the sustainability box or the ESG box uh, and seen as a soft HR issue. But it is actually a hardcore business issue to ensure that you have a breadth of diversity of views and experiences in decision-making settings at the highest executive levels. That drives businesses forward. But, uh, Carolyn, how do you make sure that this happens? I mean, again, there was a number of big chief executives mm. that actually also had their paychecks tied to diversity mm, yes. and inclusion. And b because of some backlash in certain mm. parts of the world, then yeah. that is no longer the case. So what's the incentive? Well, the incentive should be that you actually make better business decisions by appreciating an inclusive leadership and, uh, and populating boards and C-suite levels with a breadth of diversity. In my own experience, having been a male executive most of my career and also a board member, I fail to see the value of that. It's very easy to gravitate towards surrounding yourself with people of your own kind, especially if you belong to the norm. And in the financial services, it's usually being a white, heterosexual male of Christian origin. I fail to understand the privileges that was associated with that. It's very hard to understand privileges if you yourself belong to the norm. Switching my management style to an inclusive one, surrounding myself and, more importantly, listening and appreciate the value of diverse perspectives, in my experience, made better business decisions, reducing business risks and led to better corporate governance. 
we need more shareholder pressure to ensure that breadth of diversity. So, so does it have to come from shareholders? And again, we know, for example, of advertisements mm. or even lawyers having to pitch with yeah. a diverse team. Yeah. Otherwise, they just yes. don't get the job. Yeah. And I'm very happy to see that, uh, that many purchases of professional services uh, put demands on having diverse delivery teams. No. Because in my experience, diverse teams perform better. So pressure from customers, pressure from shareholders, mm -hmm. and also from the new generation, mm -hmm. uh, new graduates expect to be included on their terms. They, they don't conform to norms as much as I did when I joined financial services 30 years ago. But, uh, Caroline, there is an understanding that actually the Nordics are way better mm -hmm. than us in terms of you know, mm -hmm. equal uh, pay, in terms mm -hmm. of paternity rights. It, it, but it's not all rosy also when it comes to diversity. No, absolutely not. And uh, I, it, it's not all good to be, uh, to be at the high end uh, of the ranking because uh, th that makes us in the Nordic field that maybe we don't have so much more to do. Yes, we do have because there are so many aspects of diversity. It goes way beyond gender. It goes uh, to ethnicity, functional variation, relig religious beliefs. But actually see it as a hardcore leadership trait to surround yourself with, with diversity views and then making the best value of those because you can bring those uniquenesses to life, making better business decisions, reducing risks in implementation and making it more relevant for your customers, showing up with diverse teams. Yeah, again, it's something that we often write about on Bloomberg, right? That diversity makes business decisions easier and better. Yes. It's difficult to show the metrics on a month basis. What, I mean, are yeah. there actually data points that you would point to to say, like, look, you, you need to hire better, more yeah. diverse because actually you just have better revenues? Well, there's no shortages of service out there made by prestigious uh, firms uh, showing that there is, in fact, a correlation between diversity on the highest executive and board levels and financial performance. But is there a causality? In my experience, yes, there is such a causality. And I've even read uh, reports on that also, showing that uh, boards with female directors actually do perform better. So why? Well, in general, female board directors are better prepared for meetings and are less prone to conform to norms uh, that you should not rock the boat in a discussion, but actually have higher integrity in questioning uh, decisions that, uh, that might not be good for the, for the shareholders. A, a lot of the big debates are now around algorithms and AI and the fact yes. that actually there's a, a innate bias yes. because you're looking at data of in the past to basically yes. forecast the future. What's the right way to deal with this? Well, you need to be very careful how you train these AI models, because if you only train the models with the data that you have accumulated from the past, you will very easily just replicate the past into the future. So you need almost to reset these, uh, these models when you populate them uh, with data, so that you can create a much more even playing field going forward. So be very careful when you train your models. Select the data. Yeah. Um, Caroline, I was also having a conversation actually with your next chief executive on, you know, inclusivity, diversity, we're talking about climate change. Mm. And he reminded everyone, you know, the audience that was there that, you know, it's, it's very difficult in France and other European countries to even collect data about the employees that you have in terms of gender and diversity yes. because of very old laws. So again, if you're in one of those countries, what's the best way for a chief executive to understand the workforce yes. to, to be able to support them rightly? Mm. Well, don't fall into the trap of just measuring what is easy to measure. For that, that was my mistake as a male CEO. I made sure I had five men and five women in my exec team. Yes, the women were legal, HR, risk management and compliance, and the guys were the business line heads, but I thought I was home free. That is not the thing. The thing is inclusiveness in the culture, where everyone feels that they belong on their terms. And you only know that if you ask them, you have deep in employee surveys, and then you, as a CEO, remove your own ego from the equation. Start to pay genuine interest in what the uniquenesses everyone on your team can bring to the table. And, and you can bring those uniquenesses to life in your business decisions. So be less preoccupied with yourself and your own strong views. That's hard because that's usually a quick road to become a CEO, to be overly confident. But you will be more successful as a CEO by listening 
and uh, taking into account other people's views on your team. You're going to the kind of the DNA, the culture of a company. How difficult is that to change, even if you're a chief executive mm. and you want to change it? You have to make sure that it permeates through everyone yes. in the organization. Well, uh, first of all, it's a cultural thing. Culture needs to be driven from the top, especially from the CEO level. And the CEO needs to have an understanding that d &I is not about doing good for other people or ticking the boxes for sustainability. It's actually becoming an even better leader yourself. So when I talk to male CEOs, I talk to their egos. That is usually the way to actually reach the hearts and say that you, Mr. CEO, you can become a much better leader if you learn this inclusiveness thing. Actually surround yourself by people not of your own kind and then start listening to them. You will make better de decisions and business will prosper. Thank you so much, Caroline Faber, with a very important, extremely important conversation, especially ahead of International Women's Day tomorrow. Coming up, the Fed is in focus after comments from the chair, Jay Powell. And of course, we have a rate decision here from the European Central Bank. So yes, we'll talk central banks next. This is Bloomberg. So central banks in focus today with the ECB rate decision and then yesterday of course the Fed chair Jay Powell said he still expects U.S. interest rates to fall this year. He goes into the second day of testimony. I know one person glued to the screen like me is Ven Ram from Bloomberg's MLive team. Ven, I love reading all of your predictions but what, what was your main takeaway from the Fed from Jay Powell yesterday and what it means for the next meeting? Morning Francine. I think that you know uh, what we saw yesterday was that Powell is not willing to throw in the towel yet on um, the, on the rate cuts that the markets are expecting. I think that you know the markets are kind of underpricing the risk that we would get a more hawkish dot plot later this month. Of course, in December, the Fed unleashed animal spirits by going overly dovish, and we know what that did to all the currencies and all the rates complex. And this time around, I think they, given the resilience of the economy, given how strong the labor market is, there is very little incentive for them to go out and say, you know, this is an economy that needs immediate accommodation. And what that means is that they will take back one of the rate cuts that they had penciled in. So we are likely to get two rate cuts for 2024 rather than the three that they had penciled in earlier. And I think that the markets, at, at least the front end treasuries, are not priced for that. If, if, the, if the Fed does what I expect it to do, then I think that the two-year yield will go up by about 25 to 30 basis points yeah. from here. We are at 456, so we, we have, there's plenty of upside from there. Um, I mean, BOJ is so, so exciting, Ven. What can we expect from them? Well, I think that, you know, the markets are increasingly thinking that we will get a rate hike this month. I don't think that's likely because I think that we you know what we saw from the BOJ's comments today was that you know they're, they're still waiting for that big signal to come from the wage unions, and that is not it. Uh, that uh, that won't likely be in place in time for this month's meeting. So I think that April we may get to see them exit negative rates. Mm -hmm. But what really happens to the yen from there is that the un yen is undervalued at current levels. I think um, Ven. there's a 4% undervaluation on those models, and I think that will correct soon. Thank you. Big Central Bank Day.